trunk. I hope that was your stomach. Um, no. That's the it. Sounds like calm. Harlan, it's human. Come. Want to see it? Don't worry. Just change the wall. A bunch of daring kids go looking for buried pirate treasure in The Goonies, the new adventure produced by Steven Spielberg. It's one of the new movies you're going to be reviewing this week on At The Movies. I'm Roger Ebert, film critic of the Chicago Sun-Times. And I'm Gene Siskel, film critic of the Chicago Tribune. In addition to Goonies, we'll also be reviewing Pritzi's Honor, a mobster comedy and love story starring Jack Nicholson. Also, Movers and Shakers, a comedy about the movie business starring Walter Matthau. But first, Roger begins with this week's latest teenage comedy. And it's called Secret of Meyer. It's a comedy about anonymous love letters, a whole series of letters that fall into the hands of the wrong people at the wrong time, are read by the wrong persons, inspiring one teenage romance, destroying another one, and almost breaking up two marriages. The hero of the film is a teenager who's in love with a blonde bombshell and who is loved by another girl who he hardly notices except as a good pal. She's the one he can always talk to, he can confide in her. And in this scene, the pal has been ghostwriting the kids' letters and doing such a good job that the sex pot wants to go out with him. Please, Tony, you gotta tell me who this is. All right. You wanna meet him tonight? Hello? Hi, it's me. Do you wanna meet her tonight? Tonight? You mean tonight, tonight? Tonight. Uh, yeah, sure, okay. Uh, does she know who I am? No, that's why she wants to meet you. Okay. Okay. Um, uh, I'm ready. What time? Eight o'clock. For Cambridge Park. Okay, thanks a lot, Tony. Thank you so much. And what do you think I should wear? Paper bag over your head. He's all yours. Oh, God. Thank you so much, Tony. You're really my best friend. What do you think I should wear? Something demure. Oh, Christian demure. I got tons of her stuff. That's Kelly Preston with the Christian demure fashions. C. Thomas Howell is the hero there, and Lori Loughlin as his best pal. And she's really good looking. I mean, she reminded me in this movie of young Natalie Wood, and that was about the only thing in the movie that I wanted to, to be reminded of. Uh, you might recognize her from The Edge of Night, where she holds the kidnapping record. I did a little research on her. She's been kidnapped seven times on that program, just in case you were interested, Gene. Right, I'm not. Thank you. While the anonymous love letters are stirring up those three lives, they have a tendency to get mislaid around the house where the parents find them. And that leads to two sets of parents believing that their partners are cheating on them. That doesn't go very well at their next bridge party. Mmm. Elizabeth, you've really outdone yourself on the affairs. <laughs> on the hors d'oeuvres. <laughs> the, 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 you said affairs! Fuck, I meant hors d'oeuvres! Oh, yeah! I don't even want your sex! something new in a teenage comedy, an adult food fight. Can I interrupt you? Because yeah. let me tell you, when I saw that scene, I thought of all these actors, these are adult actors, some mm -hmm. decent names, did they go to acting school? Did they train so that they could get hit in the head with a metal plate? Uh, that scene made me so sad. I felt sorry for each of those people to have to do that kind of work. Well, you're bringing up a whole interesting question here because obviously if the movie had worked, you wouldn't mind that they were hit by the metal plate. Mm -hmm. Well, I, no, I just say that scene is so stupid, and uh, it, it was a desperate, desperate scene, and I felt sorry for the people who had to perform it. Well, Get now, back with now your we review. have your opinion. I was about to say those warring couples were played, and would you like to know who they were? Yeah, Ted I would. Ward, Lee Taylor Young, Clifty Young, and D. Wallace Stone. They've been good movies. to acting school in order to be hit over the head and have their head put in aquariums there. Basically, I didn't think the story of the grown-ups was all that necessary mm -hmm. to this movie anyway. Mm -hmm. I liked a lot better the story of the kid who yearns after the blonde bombshell that he idealizes, and he just, he's blind. He just can't see that his best friend is really this girl who loves him the best, and she's the girl that he ought to love. Secret Admirer doesn't stick to that little story that would have been fun, though. This movie 
wants to have something for everyone. So there are beer blasts and food fights, car crashes, domestic mm -hmm. quarrels. Something that really bothered me was the glamorizing of teenage drinking in this film. I don't think that was a good idea. The sensitive performance is at the center of the film by C. Thomas Holman and Lori Laughlin are completely lost. C. Thomas Howell, yeah. Howell, uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, that's something for everyone, I think, is the best line in your review, in the sense that these people don't have the guts. You have a very interesting character, and I think the most interesting character is the young woman. The, yeah, the, the, Lori Laughlin. The, the brunette. Mm -hmm. All, always the brunettes are the good ones. The blondes are bad. That hasn't changed. <laughs> uh, her story of how she feels, if we had her talking to another friend about it, mm -hmm, if we mm -hmm. had more of an exploration of that, mm -hmm. I think you could have had a very interesting film. Uh, instead, no scenes with her alone really talking about it. We, we see the camera play it on her, in other words, and she's, you know, tense by this situation, but we don't see her talk about it, share, share about it. It, it goes for action over some kind of emotion. I, you know, I want to get to be just a little bit cynical about this film. You know the whole business about how the average teenage movie audience is, you know, yeah. 17, 18 years old? Yeah. And then when the movies go into video cassette, they're being rented by people over the age of 25 or 30. Oh, so you're home? saying they both got it's something it. for everyone. The kids can see the teenage movie, then yeah. when it goes into cassette, the adults can say, hey, there are four couples who are our age. I just don't it's think... Just, it yeah. seems to be that machine Well, made. okay, but I, I, I think that actually when the writer sits down and writes it, I think that they stop writing about the teenagers and don't write the extra scene, the, the developed scene. They just say, all right, now let's get something else going. Right. This had a lot of the same elements that the sure thing had, yeah. but it had all this other stuff that was totally wasted. Coming up next at the movies, you're going to find out whether the Goonies is the name of the good guys or the bad guys. Haven't you ever heard of that guy? What, what's his name? The pirate guy. One-Eyed Willie. That'll do anything to get you to go to sleep. The eagerly awaited films of the summer movie season. It's The Goonies, based on a story by Steven Spielberg about a group of kids who hunt for a long lost pirate treasure in an effort, for some of them at least, to save their parents' homes from foreclosure by greedy real estate developers. Here's one of the opening scenes from the film where the kids stumble upon a pirate map. What are you doing? Hey, Mike found the map! Yeah, hey, look, 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 that says 1632. Is that a year, sir? You know, it's your top score on pulses. Yes, it's a year, Chuck. Look, 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 look it's a map of our coastline. What's all that map. Spanish junk right there? Uh, who knows? Mouth, mouth, you said you could translate. Translate, right here. Yeah, translate it. Ye intruders beware. Crushing death and grief. Soaked with blood of the trespassing thief. You guys, this map is old news. Everybody and their grandfather went looking for that. When our parents were our age, I mean, I mean, haven't you ever heard of that guy? What, what's his name? Uh, the pirate guy. One-Eyed Willie. One-Eyed Willie. Yeah, he was the most famous pirate in his time. My dad told me all about him once. Dad'll do anything to get you to go to sleep. <laughs> Now, much later in the film, the kids get closer to all those jewels in a cave. But the whole place, just like in Indiana Jones, has been booby-trapped. Guys, please, don't move. Don't move. You guys, don't move back there! Don't move! Let us free! That's all going on. They're being chased by three clownish thieves who would like to recover the pirate treasure themselves. The Goonies is intended to be sort of a modern-day pirate movie with the kids in the starring roles. And once the kids are in that tunnel, the picture is a good deal of fun, particularly when the chubby kid in the group, we saw him in that first scene where he's talking about the emeralds, played by Jeff Cohn. He forms sort of a friendship with a nice monster down in the tunnel, and that is kind of cute because it gives us a little rooting interest in them recovering the treasure, or at least in those two characters surviving. But the big problem with the Goonies is that it takes forever to get this story underway. The introduction to the kids is mechanical, just they talk all over each other, interrupt each other. They trade insults. The opening scene with the robbers is really limp comedy. I'm going to give this film a marginal thumbs up because it eventually does turn into a fun picture. But my advice would be, Walk in a half an hour late.
You won't miss a thing, and I think you'll enjoy the movie more. I'll tell you something, Gene. In the first half hour or so of this film, I found it difficult to understand the dialogue. Yes, I did, too. The kids are all talking at the same time. They're on each other's lines. And, and Roger, didn't you know that it was sort of a stylistic device? In other words, that the director, Richard Donner, said, all right, now, keep talking, oh, interrupt each other, keep talking yeah. like, like real kids talk. Because they're real bright, and so they're going to be talking all the time, and we're going to get them. But the problem is, after a while, you, say, you, you sit back in your seat. You say... I'm mad at this movie. If it doesn't want to let me hear it, then I don't want to sit here and have to work. But then, you're right, after about half an hour, it picks up. And the way it picks up is it turns into a child's version, or a t young teenager version, mm -hmm. of Indiana Jones. Right. And the, particularly Raiders of the Lost Ark, you right. have the spikes coming up from the floor right. of the cave, you have the boulders coming down, you have the treasure, right. you have all the secrets. And although, essentially, the producer Spielberg is ripping off himself, it works. I mean, the special effects are great, yeah. the adventures are thrilling, yeah. and it does work on that level. Well, I think kids will like it. Yeah. I liked it. I mean, I yeah. like the back half of it. I, yeah. I thought one fault was that there weren't enough people to root for, and that's why I like this friendship between the fat kid and this big monster, uh -huh. because those uh -huh. were characters that, that at least had some emotion. There's a little crying involved yeah. between them. There's a kiss even between them, mm -hmm. a sharing of a Baby Ruth candy bar. Yeah. Those are nice scenes. I wish there had been more that, characters that in the film like that. That kind of reminded me of that great old movie, The Bride of Frankenstein, where you have the friendship right. there goes on for just a little bit the monster becomes human next at the movies jack nicholson is a mafia hit man who falls in love with a mafia hit woman dominic's put out a contract he's on her and it stars jack nicholson as a third generation member of a proud east coast mafia family nicholson is in charge of a lot of the dirty business of the family like collections and enforcement and murder he's a bachelor in his 40s living alone and liking it when one day he goes to attend a mafia wedding and his eyes meet the eyes of a woman he's never seen before. A woman all dressed in lavender, a woman who looks straight back at him and it's electric. At the reception after the wedding, he asks her to dance and it's love at first sight. Some spread, huh? Haven't I seen you before? I'm sure I'd remember. I mean... Maybe he's went to Marymount with the bride or something. <laughs> Could never miss you. And you are? Charlie Partana, pleased to meet you. That's Kathleen Turner from Body Heat, and Nicholson discovers she works for the mob, too. She's a professional killer from the West Coast. Completely confused, he turns for advice to a former girlfriend he thinks he can trust. She organized a scam at Vegas. I go looking for the bad guy, and it turns out to be my woman. Can you imagine this? Not only that, Pop tells me she's the peace man for the Netabino contract. Which is the same. I love her, May. I love her. Well. How can I live with this? I gotta do something about it. I gotta straighten it out. Then do. Do what? Do I ice her? Do I marry her? Which one of these? Marry her, Charlie. Just because she's a thief and a hitter doesn't mean she's not a good woman in all the other departments. <laughs> That's a great That's line. Terrific. Very funny. Later on, she says she's an American. She wants to make a dollar. Right. I like Nicholson there. He has something under his upper lip that kind of gives him a Bogart look, and it goes with that Brooklyn accent. That was Angelica Houston as his former fiance. He takes her advice and marries Kathleen Turner, and they have a sort of a commuter's marriage between pulling jobs on both coasts. There's a running gag of a plane flying back and forth. Then Nicholson is assigned to kidnap a bank president, and in this scene, Nicholson and his father listen as Turner comes up with some bright ideas and adds her own twist to the plan. Now, you know, you guys, you need a woman on this stand. A woman? Yeah. Look, Charlie, the woman comes out of the South apartment holding a baby. After Falaji's bodyguard gets him out of his apartment, she smiles at them. She goes goo goo gaga to the baby. Then she tosses the little darling at the bodyguard, who naturally tries to catch it. Now, while he's doing that, she gets her piece out and covers him. Then you come out of the other apartment, you take Falaji down to the garage. Then she takes the bodyguard back into Falaji's apartment, does a job on him there. Hmm? Hey, that's good. For Christ's sake. Where are we gonna get a baby? Where are we gonna find a broad would do something like this? Where? Here. Me. We got a fake baby. Hey, good thinking, Irene. Mm. You guys work it out. I got a terrific dinner almost ready. Just be a couple minutes. Pop, 
What's the matter with you? I didn't get married so my wife could go on working. <laughs> Classic problem. Yeah, I like family. this. The whole business of Kathleen Turner having no problem at all with fixing the nice dinner and setting up a murder. It's right. the same kind of duality she had in body heat. And, and, it's a, it, but, and that's the theme that runs throughout the whole thing. It's a family, a murdering family. And, and they they have, here's, oh. here's our business. Here's yeah. our home life, you know, <laughs> and here we go. Fritzy's honor is very heavy on plot. It's a real complicated plot based on a novel by Richard Condon who loves to construct those labyrinthine twists and turns and surprises. And by the time Turner is hired by Nicholson's uncle to kill Nicholson, we're hardly even surprised anymore. The movie's a dark comedy, weird and gloomy, and with that wonderful contrast between Jack Nicholson's Brooklyn Italian accent and Kathleen Turner, Turner's criminal chic. It was directed by John Huston, who is 78 going on 79, and still turning out one good movie after another. This is his first film since Under the Volcano last year, and you have to ask, how many directors of any age could put those two movies together back to back? I think it's really one of the year's finest films. Yes, it I, is. I tell you, we've seen so much junk. Secret Admirer, 97 copies of that. Mm -hmm. Here is a film for adults. I suppose young people would like it too. It's intelligent, it's funny. Mm -hmm. it, I'm glad you picked up on the dark and gloomy because I mm -hmm. want to stress that too. Mm -hmm. I know it's a comedy and I know there's a lot of funny stuff in there. Mm -hmm. But the most interesting character in the film for me probably is the Angelica Houston character. Mm -hmm. Spurned as a lover, she's gonna get even somehow, and, and her character is played straight, mm -hmm. not for comic effect. I think it's a terrific performance. It, I think it's the, it's the most interesting character in the film, and that makes the humor even that and much she, sweeter. The, the title gives it away, Pritzy's Honor. It's not right. only the honor of the men in the family, the grandfather, who's the, the senile right. old Don, Don. Oh, beautiful or the uncles who are killing each right. other because of the honor of the family. Right. The family's <laughs> honor is more impo so important. You kill a member of the family to save the family, and here she is, <laughs> And she's got her honor, too. She doesn't say a lot, yeah. And it just, it really builds and it grows. And this movie has something so many movies don't have, style. Oh, including yes. Including the choice that Nicholson made to go for that character in the strange kind of voice. Yeah. Uh, the first two minutes you say, what's he talking like that for? Then you think, this is great. Nicholson is, is so good in taking those chances. Yeah, I, I think he could do without the accent, actually. Really? Yeah, I thought... He, he used a little bit of a, a dumb accent in uh, The Fortune, and I didn't uh -huh. buy it there. He's one of the smartest people in the world, in the movies, uh, the movie world at least, and uh, I think he could have pulled it off without an accent. But, I, but I, that's uh, just a minor, minor point. This is a terrific it piece is, of film. It is. It's a real good film. I agree with you. Coming up next at the movies, Walter Matthau is a movie executive trying to make a film based on the title of a sex manual. I would just be thinking out loud. Yes? Love and sex is about the love in sex. It's going to make its way around the country. It's called Movers and Shakers, and it's a send-up of how stupid and shallow the people who make movies can be. Well, that's an easy target, as you can see in this scene, where Charles Grodin plays a writer who has been summoned by studio production chief Walter Matthau to write a movie based on the title of a best-selling sex manual called Love in Sex. Love in Sex is about the love in sex. Yes. A tribute to love and romance. Tribute. Yeah. An up story, a happy story, a love story. I'm thinking out loud. Go ahead. A lot of pretty, up, romantic people. Now that's kind of cute, but what is deadly dull in Movers and Shakers is the unhappy relationship between Charles Grodin Nancy. and his wife, played by Tyne Daly from Cagney and Lacey. What are you so angry with me for? I'm not angry with you. Nancy, I'm in spasm again. My chest hurts. My legs ache. My, my, my legs head hurts ache. and my I arm, have an eye ache. My foot hurts. Well, this is terrible. I mean, really. Now stay where you are. Now get away from me. You stay on your side of the bed. What is it? What's the matter? I'm sorry. I'm unhappy. <laughs> I, you, don't, you don't know who I am. He doesn't know who she is, and I don't know what she's doing in this movie. The scenes between the two of them are some of the most awkward moments in movie history. That's not an exaggeration. They have no place in what is essentially a comedy, and a not very funny one at that. The story conference is cute, but other than that, Movers and Shakers takes a very easy target and doesn't say much that's either new or funny about it. You're right. I thought it was going to be fairly good from the beginning where yeah. they have this giant dinosaur that's been left over from a dinosaur picture that failed. And so right. they're going to put the dinosaur out as a monument to the guy who lost it. I figured they were going to remake a dinosaur movie. That might have been Something cute. Something like that might have been funny. Nothing in this movie is funny after the first 10 or 15 minutes. Now let's take another look at the movies we reviewed this week.
Two Thumbs Down for Secret Admirer, another dumb beer and food fight mm -hmm. film with a good performance by Lori Loughlin. Two Thumbs Up for Steven Spielberg's The Goonies, which is a good entertainment after a very slow start. We both agreed on Fritzy's Honor. We thought it was a great movie. A terrific change of pace after a summer full of teenage movies. And finally, two thumbs down for Movers and Shakers, the Hollywood comedy that goes nowhere. So, so Princey's Honor, right? There is something for adults to see this week at the movies. Adults and anyone who loves of movies. intelligence, which yeah. includes a lot of teenagers who don't like these teenage movies any more than we do. That's it for this week. Next time we'll be back with reviews of Cocoon, an adventure story about some old folks meeting some magical, even older folks from another planet. And we'll also look at the new sequel, Return to Oz. And until then, we'll see you at the movies. Thank <laughs> you.